that was unimaginable just five years ago. And this is the result of surprising new connections that have been found between gravity and condensed matter physics. And I'm going to discuss this um, using superconductivity as an example. In fact, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the discovery of superconductivity. So it seems appropriate to consider an entirely new way of viewing the subject. The starting point is the following remarkable claim that you already heard about two days ago in Shiraz Manwala's talk. The claim is that in addition to describing gravitational phenomena, such as black holes, gravitational waves, etc., general relativity can also describe non-gravitational physics. Shiraz talked about an application to fluid dynamics, and I'm going to tell you about an application to superconductivity. Um, so, an, whoops. so an outline for the talk is the following. I'm going to start by reviewing black hole thermodynamics, since that plays an important role in our story. Kip Thorne gave a very nice review of this during a mini session back at the very beginning of this conference, but since not everybody was there, I'll uh, spend a little time just uh, reviewing this briefly. Next, I'll tell you about this remarkable gauge gravity duality, which is also called ADS-CFT, which is a main tool which allows us to use general relativity to describe non-gravitational phenomena. And finally, I will uh, describe or tell you about using general relativity to describe superconductivity, including some recent work um, in which we reproduce Joseph's injunctions. Joseph's injunctions are two superconductors separated by a uh, weak link. And they're the main uh, way in which superconductors are used in, in many devices. So to begin, um, as you all know, uh, back in 1973, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking formulated the laws of black hole mechanics. Uh, there was a zeroth law which said that for stationary black holes, um, the surface gravity kappa is uh, constant on the horizon. A first law which said that if you perturb a stationary black hole, the mass, area of a horizon, and uh, angular momentum change in, this, uh, in the way given here, involving the surface gravity kappa and the um, angular velocity omega of the black hole. And finally, there was a second law which said the area of the event horizon always increases. Now, it was immediately noticed that if you think of kappa, the surface gravity, as analogous to a temperature and the area of the event horizon as analogous to an entropy, um, these laws were uh, very analogous to the laws of ordinary thermodynamics. But at the time, it was thought this could only be an analogy because if black holes really had a temperature, they would radiate and everybody knew that nothing could come out of a black hole. Well, two years later, everything changed. Hawking coupled quantum matter fields to a classical black hole and discovered his famous radiation, that black holes indeed radiate essentially a thermal radiation with a temperature proportional to the surface gravity. So he derived this formula that uh, the temperature was h bar kappa over 2 pi, and then plugging that back into the first law, uh, you discover that black holes uh, have an entropy which is equal to the area of the event horizon divided by four in Planck units. Um, now, it turns out that black hole thermodynamics is actually better defined with anti de Sitter boundary conditions. So anti de Sitter space is the maximally symmetric solution of Einstein's equation with a negative cosmological constant. If you try to construct an equilibrium of a black hole and thermal radiation in asymptotically flat space, you find that since the energy density has to be constant all the way out to infinity, the solution really is more like a cosmology and the space in, in you get evolution and the space either expands or contracts. With asymptotically anti de Sitter boundary conditions, the negative curvature acts like a confining box and you can construct static uh, configurations of black holes in equilibrium with the, their thermal radiation as Hawking and Page showed back in 1983. Black holes in anti-de-sitter space are actually, uh, is actually a much richer subject 
than black holes with the standard asymptotically flat boundary conditions because in addition to the usual spherical black holes, there are planar black holes, black holes with translational symmetry where the horizon geometry is just a plane and even black holes with hyperbolic uh, uh, horizons. Now spherical black holes in anti de Sitter space have a minimum temperature. Uh, so here's a plot of the temperature as a function of the uh, horizon radius. At small radius, um, the black holes behave just like Schwarzschild. The temperature goes like one over uh, the Schwarzschild radius or not. And these small black holes can evaporate just like they do in asymptotically flat space. But if the black hole gets big, and big here is relative to something called the ADS radius L, where the cosmological constant is minus three over L squared. So when the size of the black hole gets bigger than this characteristic scale set by the cosmological constant, uh, the, you discover that the temperature starts growing linearly with the um, size of the black hole. That means that these black holes have positive specific heat. They actually get hotter when you add energy to them. And you can see from this diagram that if you consider a thermal state at temperatures below this minimum temperature, uh, you don't have a black hole. What you have is just a gas of particles in this box, this anti de Sitter box. And there's a phase transition between this gas of particles um, and the black hole. Actually, the large black hole is what you get when you raise the temperature. The small black hole never dominates in the canonical ensemble. Um, and this phase transition is called the Hawking Page transition. Now, we'll be mostly interested in the planar black hole. Um, and this has a metric which is given here. I'm now setting the ADS radius L equal to one. So the metric is written. You can see it's manifestly translationally invariant and static. It's given just in terms of this one function of R, F of R. Um, and F is given just in terms of one parameter, R naught, which is the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, these planar black holes have a Hawking temperature, which is just proportional to R naught. Um, their total energy is given by um, R naught cubed times the volume, which is just T cubed times the volume. And the entropy, which of course is related to the area of the event horizon, is just R naught squared times the volume, which is T the Reisner Nordstrom solution. Entropy at zero temperature is very unusual. It indicates some highly degenerate ground state. Um, but we're going to see that once you couple um, some other matter fields to the theory, uh, these riser nordstrom like black holes um, can become unstable at low temperature and the new stable black hole actually has zero entropy as the temperature goes to zero. Okay, so now let me turn to this gauge gravity duality. Um, and to, to explain that, I need to say a few words about gauge theories and string theory. So gauge theories are just generalizations of electromagnetism in which the usual U1 uh, gauge invariance is replaced by a non-abelian group, uh, often SUN. Our standard model of particle physics is based on a gauge theory and quantum chromodynamics has an SU3 gauge symmetry um, where the interactions are weak at high energy uh, but become strong at low energy uh, causing quark confinement. Tehuft argued back in the 1970s that a 1 over N expansion of an SUN gauge theory would resemble a theory of strings. And he argued for this based on the structure of the perturbation expansion. It took more than 20 years for this idea to be made precise. Now what's string theory? String theory is a promising candidate for both a complete quantum theory of gravity and a unified theory of all particles and forces. And it's based on the idea that particles are not point-like but actually um, one dimensional extended objects and the different particles are just different exc excitations of this one dimensional string. The evolution of a string in space time forms a two dimensional world sheet and the basic interaction of a string is just that that world sheet can split into two or conversely two strings can join uh, and form one. There's a coupling constant in string theory uh, which measures the strength of that interaction. It's certainly not obvious from what I've just said, but one of the early successes of string theory was that it was shown that this theory actually does include general relativity and in fact reduces to general relativity coupled to certain matter fields in a classical limit. 
Now we come to gauge gravity duality. This claim, or this conjecture, is that with anti to sitter boundary conditions, string theory, which I just said includes gravity, is completely equivalent to a non-gravitational gauge theory living on the boundary of space-time at infinity. First sight, this seems absolutely crazy. The string theory doesn't look at all like a gauge theory. But the key point is that when the string theory is weakly coupled, the gauge theory is strongly coupled and vice versa. So this is a weak, strong coupling duality. This shows that quantum gravity, at least with anti to sitter boundary conditions, is holographic. It can be completely described by degrees of freedom living on the boundary of space. And the idea that quantum gravity might be holographic was argued for earlier by Tuft and Susskind based on black hole entropy ideas. Now setting the ADS radius equal to one, we can write anti to sitter space in this simple form, sometimes called Poincare coordinates, in which you uh, have R squared times the usual Minkowski metric plus the R squared over R squared. Um, if you go out to large R and can formally rescale this metric by one over R squared, you see the metric at infinity is just Minkowski space. And this is the space time that the gauge theory lives on. You might ask, what's the physical interpretation of this extra radial direction in, in the bulk, as, as, as people say? And that comes from this symmetry. Anti to sitter space has a scaling symmetry in which this, um, if you rescale the radial coordinate by a constant a and you rescale the other coordinates by 1 over a, uh, the metric's invariant. So small radius corresponds to long distance or low energy in the gauge theory. Now soon after this um, idea was put forward, there were two immediate uh, applications. There was applications uh, to strongly coupled gauge theories. And it was one of the sort of outcomes was a nice geometric picture of confinement. It was also used to uh, gain insight into quantum gravity, and in particular, the quantum properties of black holes. Uh, let me say a word about that. Of course, two of the main questions which came up in studying or thinking about black holes uh, is what is the origin of this enormous black hole entropy? And does black hole evaporation lose information? Does it violate quantum mechanics? Hawking argued for three decades that it did. Now we have answers from gauge gravity duality. It turns out that the gauge theory does have enough microstates to explain the entropy of black holes. And furthermore, since the formation and evaporation of a small black hole in anti to sitter space can be mapped to a problem in this gauge theory, which has ordinary Hamiltonian evolution, it's clear that quantum mechanics isn't violated and information isn't lost. And after 30 years, Hawking finally conceded this point in 2004. Now, I've been talking about string theory and quantum gravity, quantum black holes, etc. But in a certain limit, all the stringy and quantum effects can be suppressed. And the theory in the bulk um, is really just general relativity with, of course, these asymptotically anti to sitter boundary conditions. And so if gauge gravity duality is correct, we should be able to use general relativity to describe non-gravitational physics. Well, a new application of this gauge gravity duality uh, came about a few years ago, and that's to condense matter. So starting in 2007, people started to try to reproduce standard condensed matter physics using uh, general relativity, and one of the earliest uh, papers showed how the Hall effect uh, could be understood uh, in gravitational terms. So the natural question is, what about superconductors? So let me turn to that. And I will assume you're not all experts in superconductivity, so I'll give you just a very brief uh, reminder of some of the properties. OK, in conventional superconductors, such as aluminum, niobium, and lead, Pairs of electrons with opposite spin can bind to form a charged boson called a Cooper pair. When you lower the temperature past a critical uh, amount, Tc, there's a second order phase transition and these charged bosons condense. The DC conductivity becomes infinite and this is all well described by a theory um, 
developed by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, the famous BCS theory uh, back in 1957. And in their theory, the binding of electrons is a result of their interaction with phonons, or lattice vibrations. This interaction is weak, allowing people to do detailed calculations, and they found good agreement with the phenomena, um, the observations of superconductors. However, 25 years ago, a whole new class of superconductors were discovered, the so-called high temperature superconductors. Uh, these are cuprates, like this yttrium barium copper oxide. Um, these materials are layered, and the superconductivity is associated with these two-dimensional uh, copper oxygen planes. The highest critical temperature that's been achieved so far today is in a mercury barium copper oxide compound, and it's about 134 degrees Kelvin. Now, just a few years ago, a new class of high temperature superconductors were discovered. Uh, these are based on iron and not copper. They are um, like iron arsenic and compounds like that. Uh, they currently have a maximum critical temperature of 56 degrees Kelvin. Uh, these materials are also um, believed to be layered. Um, they also involve pairing of electrons, but the pairing mechanism is not understood. And unlike BCS theory um, or the standard superconductors, the pairing, this mechanism is not weakly coupled. So, of course, it makes it much harder. And it's tempting to try to use gauge gravity duality to gain insight into these high temperature superconductors. Now, I'll warn you right away that we're not able to say anything um, at this point about any real world material, but we're just going to try to reproduce um, some standard properties of superconductors using general relativity ideas. So, how do you go about doing that? Well, the minimal ingredients you need to try to reproduce a superconductor is you clearly need uh, a notion of temperature, and that's provided on the gravity side by a black hole. The Hawking temperature of the black hole is, according to gauge gravity duality, just the temperature of the uh, theory on the boundary. We also need a notion of a condensate, this sort of Cooper pair bosonic condensate that's formed at low temperature, and we're going to model that by an ordinary charge scalar field. So the task now is to find a black hole that has scalar hair at low temperature, but no hair at high temperature. Now that's not an easy task. There is something called no hair theorems, which tell you that when you try to put simple matter fields outside a black hole, it wants to either fall into the black hole or radiate off to infinity, and it's very hard to find matter that just sits in some static configuration outside the black hole, which you need for black hole hair. Now, it's known as not impossible because there have been examples of black holes with hair, but the matter field is not linear and involves some more complicated um, interactions. So this looked like a difficult problem until Steve Gupser, early in 2008, pointed out that a charge scalar field around a charged black hole in anti de Sitter space might do the trick. So he considered the following theory, and it looks a little uh, daunting, but it's really very simple. It's just general relativity with a negative cosmological constant coupled to a standard Maxwell action and then coupled to the standard action for a charged and massive scalar field. And now the point is that if your black hole is electrically charged, the effective mass of the scalar field is in fact the mass you put in to the Lagrangian plus an extra term coming from the coupling to the vector potential. And this second term is negative, GTT is negative, and so this can become large and negative enough to destabilize the scalar field near the horizon, causing the setting, you know, the zero scalar field to become unstable and want to uh, become non-zero. Um, I'm working now in just four space-time dimensions in the ADS, so that'll be appropriate for a two plus one dimensional superconductor, um, which is uh, relevant for these uh, sort of copper oxygen planes. Everything goes through in, in higher dimensions, so people have also done this in, uh, say, five-dimensional anti de Sitter, which would be appropriate for a three plus one dimensional superconductor. Okay, so now we want to actually construct these hairy black holes. So you make an ansatz uh, for your metric in which you put in the manifest, well, the fact that you want it to be static, translationally invariant, 
um, and you have two metric functions, g and chi, both functions of r. Uh, the vector potential is just have the time component, so you get phi of r, and you assume your scalar field is also just a function of r. Um, you end up with four coupled nonlinear ordinary differential equations, which can be solved numerically. At the horizon, you have boundary conditions that this function g must vanish, so you have a horizon. Uh, you want phi to vanish and chi to go to a constant. Asymptotically, you require the metric to approach anti de Sitter space. Um, the scalar field is, of course, complex, but one of the equations says that the phase is constant, so we can set it equal to zero. Now, asymptotically, the matter fields behave uh, as follows. Uh, the vector potential goes to a constant mu minus another constant rho over r, and the scalar field, well, the actual fall off here depends on the choice of mass you put into your Lagrangian, but for a convenient choice of the mass, you find that this just falls off like one over r squared. Now, gauge gravity duality relates the asymptotic behavior of your gravity solutions to properties of the dual uh, field theory. And part of the dictionary um, is that this leading term here, mu, represents the chemical potential in the dual theory. And this first, this one over r term, is just the charge density, which is what it was in gravity anyway. Uh, it also says that for every uh, field, like the scalar field in the uh, bulk, there's a certain operator in the dual theory. So this operator we call O2, because it turns out to be dimension two operator. And the expectation value of this operator is just given by this coefficient in the leading term in the behavior of the scalar field as you go off to infinity. So now you construct the solutions and see what you get. When do you have scalar hair and what's the value of this condensate, this um, O2, uh, as a function of temperature? And you get a plot like this. So this is now a dimensionless measure of the condensate on the vertical axis versus a dimensionless measure of temperature on the horizontal axis. The first thing you notice is that at high temperature, there is no condensate. There is no scalar field outside the horizon at high temperature. Um, there is a critical temperature, which turns out to be proportional to the chemical potential. That is um, not surprising. It's basically the only scale in the problem. Uh, and then when you fall below this critical temperature, the condensate rises rapidly and approaches a constant at low temperature. This behavior is exactly what's predicted by BCS theory and observed in many superconductors. Um, if you look at the solution, you discover that as T goes to zero, the horizon area vanishes. So this is now behaving very different from Reiser Nordstrom and these solutions do tend to go to zero entropy at zero temperature. You can look at the, um, the nature of this phase transition. You can compute the free energy of these black holes with scalar hair and compare to the free energy of the Reiser Nordstrom solution with the same, say, chemical potential and zero uh, hair. And you discover that these hairy black holes always have lower free energy, so they, in fact, dominate. And um, the difference goes like Tc minus T squared, so it's a continuous, uh, it's a second order phase transition exactly like one wants for a uh, superconductor. Okay, that's the condensate, but what about the conductivity? Sort of the defining property of a uh, superconductor is its infinite uh, conductivity. So we can calculate that as well. Uh, gauge gravity duality says that transport properties um, like the conductivity can be obtained by simply perturbing your uh, black hole. So we perturb the Maxwell field around the black hole. Uh, we'll assume a harmonic time dependence, e to the minus i omega t. And at the event horizon, we're going to assume the obvious thing that there are only ingoing waves uh, at the event horizon. That's the causal physical boundary condition. And that gives us causal propagation in the boundary theory. At large radius, this, um, this is now the pertur perturbation in the Maxwell field. We had only a time component in the background. We're now adding a X component. Um, and it goes to some leading term plus a one over R correction, et cetera. The gauge gravity duality says that this leading term is the vector potential in the dual theory. 
Um, so if you remember there's harmonic time dependence here, this is basically saying that the electric field that you impose on the boundary is just the limit of the electric field that you have in the bulk. And this first subleading correction gives us an expectation value of some induced current. So typically the, what happens is the leading term in the expansion is like a source and the first subleading correction is like the response to that source. Well now we can compute the conductivity using Ohm's law. J equals sigma E, so sigma is just J over E using the fact that these are homogeneous uh, solutions with only time dependence, E is minus A dot and you have the harmonic time dependence so you write that time derivative as minus I over omega and finally you just replace the current with the sort of what it is in the gravity solution, this first subleading term A1 and the uh, vector potential with the leading term and you discover that the frequency dependent conductivity is directly proportional to the ratio of these two terms in the asymptotic behavior of the perturbation about your black hole. So you do the calculation and what do you get? Uh, you get plots like this where I'm now plotting the real part of the conductivity along the vertical axis as a function of frequency. Uh, these curves represent successively lower and lower temperature. And um, so if you are above the critical temperature, the conductivity is just constant. It's uh, sitting right there. Um, and as you be go below the critical temperature, you start to notice a gap at low frequency. The conductivity drops to lower and lower um, uh, values, so you open up a gap. This is the behavior that's seen uh, and expected in, in superconductors. Uh, having to do with the gap for charged excitations above um, the Fermi surface in, in the superconducting state. But in addition to this, you get a delta function right at omega equal to zero. And so there's a delta function right here which represents the infinite DC conductivity characteristic of superconductors. Um, thank you. So uh, that of course is not something you'll see by, by just uh, integrating a differential equation and, and computing the real part, but these solutions are complex. The perturbations are complex because we've imposed this ingoing wave boundary condition at the horizon and there's a relation that one can prove between the real part and imaginary part of um, these causal perturbations and it says that if the imaginary part has a pole, the real part has to have a delta function. And so you compute the imaginary part as well and you see a very clear pole uh, developing when you're below the critical temperature and so that uh, you can infer that there's this delta function here. So we're getting all the phenomenology of, of superconductors from a simple model of um, black holes in anti de Sitter space. Now that was done um, about three years ago now. So I'd now like in the last part of my talk to tell you about some recent work uh, involving Joseph's injunctions. So a Joseph's injunction consists of two superconductors separated by a weak link. And there are different types of Joseph's injunctions depending on the nature of this weak link. So they are, the, the gap could be an ordinary insulator giving SIS junctions. It could be a normal conductor giving SNS junctions or it could even be a very little narrow piece of a superconductor, this narrow superconducting bridge. And Josephson predicted that even without any voltage difference across the junction, you will have a current flowing through it where the current is given um, by some maximum current times the sign of the phase difference in the condensate in the two superconductors. So we, that's what we're going to try to reproduce and we're going to do it um, using an SNS uh, junction. Okay, it turns out that you can do this using the same gravity model that we had before. It's just general relativity coupled to a Maxwell field and a charge scalar. Um, but you have to look at more general solutions. So recall that the critical temperature of our superconductor was set by the chemical potential. So now let's imagine taking a chemical potential with the form given here and it's now clear that there will be a range of temperatures for which will be below the critical temperature almost everywhere except in the gap and in the gap you'll be above the critical temperature. 
If you're above the critical temperature, the ordinary riser Nordstrom black hole I said acts like an ordinary conductor with finite conductivity. And so this indeed models an SNS Josephs injunction. Um, you can check that the critical temperature for this junction is just the same as the uh, homogeneous case with mu set by mu infinity. Okay, so I'm skipping a lot of steps here, but um, you can solve the uh, equations uh, in the bulk with this new boundary condition that the um, uh, field A sub T at infinity has this uh, profile. So here is a three-dimensional plot of A sub T as a function of X. X is the coordinate which goes along the junction. And this is like a compactified radial variable. Uh, it's convenient to do this numerically. So Z is just one minus R naught over R. So at infinity, Z goes to one. And at the horizon, it goes to zero. And you get these nice, beautiful plots where um, the leading behavior at infinity is just this mu. And then it smoothly goes to zero because, um, as I said, regularity at the horizon requires that A uh, sub T vanish there. Uh, you can look at other things. Um, the scalar field, and by this I mean the magnitude of the scalar field uh, looks like this. It has to fall off like one over R squared at infinity, so it's going to zero there. Um, it goes in the region outside the gap. The scalar field grows as it did in the ordinary uh, superconductor and is not zero at the horizon. But inside the gap, you see it, st it stays highly suppressed. The gap is not superconducting, and so the condensate is sort of doesn't want to be there, but it's forced to be there a little bit just from the uh, geometry and the equations. Okay, I, uh, you also get results for what the phase of the scalar field is doing and, and um, what the sort of an X component of the vector uh, potential is doing from which you can then read off a current. And in the interest of time, let me skip all the details and just show you the conclusion. Uh, the conclusion is a plot like this. So here I am plotting uh, the current across the junction on the vertical axis as a function of the phase difference um, between the sort of superconductors on either side. Uh, the red dots are the numerical results of our calculation. And the solid line is the best fit sine curve. And you see it works beautifully. So we indeed have reproduced this basic Josephson uh, 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 junction that the current goes like the sine of the phase difference across the junction. You can ask other questions. You can say, how does the maximum current across the junction uh, change when you change the width of the junction? And so we looked at that. And here is the maximum current J max as a function of the uh, width of the junction. And you see that it falls off. Again, the red dots are um, the numerics. The solid line here is a fit to an exponential. And the fit is extremely good saying that the um, maximum current uh, decreases exponentially like e to the minus the, the width of the junction divided by some correlation length. Um, and this is just what we find. Uh, this little plot inside here is uh, just the theory of Joseph's injunction says that you should get similar behavior for the condensate at the center of the junction. We looked at that and indeed we get exactly the same uh, behavior uh, sort of with the same type of fall off for the condensate at the center of the junction. Okay, so I've been talking about um, superconductors, but over the last few years there has been a lot of interest in this uh, relation between gravity and condensed matter. Uh, many people have contributed and they've studied different types of condensed matter uh, phenomena. And they've shown that general relativity can indeed uh, describe um, Fermi surfaces, uh, Fermi and non-Fermi liquids, uh, quantum critical points. So a host of, of condensed matter th uh, phenomenon has now been realized in some uh, sort of geometry, some gravity dual. And I, I know of several condensed matter physicists who are now actively learning and in some cases teaching general relativity just so that they can master this wonderful new tool which seems to be available to study um, their uh, systems. So um, to summarize, we've seen that black holes and anti sitter behave exactly like a thermal system in one lower dimension. Gauge gravity duality says that this is not a coincidence, but in fact part of a much deeper relation uh, between gravity and non-gravitational physics. 
And we've seen that we can indeed recover um, aspects of superconductivity and Joseph's injunctions using general relativity. So let me conclude with just a few uh, final comments. Um, so first of all, this duality allows us to compute dynamical transport properties of strongly coupled systems at non-zero temperature. Condensed matter physicists have very few tools that allow them to do that, which is why this is so exciting. Unfortunately, at present, this can only be applied to theories that the condensed matter physicists don't care about. So the dual systems have features which are not very physical at the moment for them, um, and they're not able to apply them to any real world uh, material. But if we follow this uh, further, learn more about the duality, and are a bit optimistic, uh, one might hope that eventually we might use gravity to actually predict new exotic states of matter and have condensed matter physicists look for them in the lab. Even more optimistically, if we're really uh, uh, wild, we might hope that one day we can learn about quantum gravity by doing condensed matter experiments. And I'll stop there. Thank you. So, so we can, you're talking about something like a London equation. Right. Um, yeah, so we can reproduce the London equation from these, uh, from a gravity uh, calculation. And the so. second question is about whether anyone has attempted to get a graph equation description of graphene from general relativity. In fact, there have been discussions of graphene. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Um, yeah, it, it's a little complicated. They, they, uh, yeah, so let me just say people are certainly interested in it and, and there are a few papers um, on it, yeah. Sure. I, I guess my kind of this when you, know, you get up to the stage where you can make some prediction that can be checked experimentally for high GT superconductors, going beyond the sort of quote-unquote phenomenology. Um, not really. Um, there is a, uh, a paper, there is um, a Condensed matter physicist uh, Jan Zanen, who has, um, well, he, he, he thinks he has a prediction. I mean, so certainly what I said was, was much too um, simple. We're, we're look, just looking at the minimal gravity model and seeing that we reproduce the basic qualitative features. Um, Zanen believes he has a signature that can be seen experimentally having to do with to a second order Josephson effect. Um, something he wants to see something about the carriers, uh, basically when the Cooper pairs tunnel across and some scaling properties of that. So he is actually talking to condensed matter physicists about doing an experiment to look for that. So that's the one case I know where somebody is actually making a prediction that he's hoping could be checked. Uh, does this, uh, this formalism describe the uh, isotope effect and the side flow superconductivity current because in these uh, different phenomena it's completely characterized the superconducting phase. Uh, did you say isotropic? Isotope effect. Oh, isotope effect. And, uh, oh. Isotope and yeah. Um, no, we can't see the isotope effect. That that's changing some you know basic properties of the nuclei. I think of the uh, lattice of, of of the superconductor, and, and we can't see that detail here. No, not yet. So, the defining characteristics of non-zero relativity is that relativity. Most importantly, the equivalence principle. These condensed matter systems or electromagnetic systems which you are talking about, there is no, no indication of any equivalence principle there. Now, when you talk about these correspondences, is it something very superficial or is it, is it deep? Um, if I tell you, like, like, for example, you know, there is electromagnetism there, and then if you add a scalar field, maybe some description is possible, but I'm asking you. Since the equivalence principle is missing, 
in the analog field. Well, or, the, the, some, or you have to find some equivalent of that. Uh, the, the equi well, many of us believe this is in fact deep and not just a superficial uh, agreement. It, it's that, that conviction is based on many, many uh, checks and many, many different applications where you seem to find similar uh, behaviors on the two sides. The equivalence principle is missing on the, on the dual uh, theory for a good reason. There's no gravity on the dual theory, so you shouldn't expect or you shouldn't ask for an equivalence principle. Um, this is a completely sort of, it's a duality which says that the physics of, of one theory which you describe in terms of some uh, variables which has no gravity at all is actually equivalent to a theory of gravity with the usual equivalence principle and everything. I mean, it's a very strange and bizarre type of statement. But I, I didn't hear that. Where did the essence evaporate? Where did what? The essence of equivalence principle, where did it evaporate? Oh, um, well, in a sense, the equivalence principle, I mean, there, there's sort of a gauge symmetry on both sides. Um, in the gauge theory, I talked about this SUN gauge theory, uh, gauge symmetry. Uh, in gravity, we have diffeomorphism invariance or, or coordinate invariance. Those gauge symmetries are very different. But we don't want to match the gauge dependent quantities. We want to match physical gauge invariant quantities. And so that's what this correspondence is all about. Gauge invariant quantities are mapped, but gauge dependence, things uh, are, not, uh, are not related. Um, basically, in this beautiful stuff which says that we are going to penalize people by difficulty in doing the strong coupling piece of quantitative difficult and uh, looking at classical general relativity and the distance computations. Uh, but then you get sort of being cautious many, many times saying that, well, yes, but this doesn't bring any good real material, uh, these are the general properties. So, what is missing? I mean, supposing I did want to make some real material then what is missing from the, the general framework that you have? Okay, the, the main thing I think which is, well, there's many things which are missing, but one of the main things is, I talked about taking a certain limit which allows us to use general relativity and suppress all the quantum effects. Um, that limit is like a large N limit in the, in the gauge theory. So when you apply this to, to condensed matter, um, condensed matter physicists don't have any obvious gauge symmetry, there's no SUN they might have a U1 gauge symmetry, and sometimes at low energies they see an emergent SU2 gauge symmetry, but they don't have SUN gauge symmetries for large N in, in real materials. And um, so that's what's, I mean, to, to use classical general relativity and to justify it for more, for real materials, you'd need to sort of find some analog of this SUN gauge symmetry. And people are thinking about that. Maybe there's some other way of thinking about large numbers of degrees of freedom. But, I mean, to me, that's actually an opportunity because if we understand this better and can find a duality which works at finite n, then we're in business for this last idea of, of actually using the condensed matter systems to tell us something about quantum gravity. So, um, but we need to understand with what's sort of the analog of this large n and business. So at the moment, it's sort of a gap both ways in the sense that we don't know what finite n would be in this matter of Right. Yeah. That's right. So, so in a way it was sort of a leap when people started taking these ideas and applying it to condensed matter. I said beforehand they were talking about, uh, you know, strongly coupled gauge theories. That's where it sort of naturally comes to you in, in, in the way the uh, conjecture was, was formulated. Uh, so you might have said, well, we don't have any gauge symmetry. It won't ever apply to condensed matter. But, you know, these few brave souls back in 2007 said, well, let's just try it and see what we get and they started getting things that looked reasonable. So the fact that it seems to be working, at least in the sense of giving us, you know, reasonable phenomenon in the condensed matter side, is encouraging people to pursue it, even though we don't have an answer to this sort of basic question. Uh, the absence of uh, entropy going to zero is we still no strong theory. Bob Horn argued that maybe the third law of thermodynamics is not important enough. Do you think this is a feedback to black hole thermodynamics to say that we should worry about it to be not being zero at the bridge speed? Certainly in this context of relating gravity to condensed matter, we have to worry about it because now we have sort of real systems and we can ask, do they sort of have zero entropy at low temperature? And most systems do. 
So if we're going to try to model that, we need to understand why the black holes actually do have zero entropy at low temperature. Yeah, and, and we've seen examples when you sort of just add some certain matter, you can do it. So uh, now for something completely different, I mean completely different from condensed matter physics, also completely different from the uh, universe. Uh, on a logarithmic scale, you know, the LHC experiments may be sort of halfway between the two. Uh, LHC, of course, is uh, probably the largest scientific endeavor uh, that humankind has already ever been engaged in. You know, 10 billion currency units, 27 kilometers in circumference, uh, 100 meters underground, uh, something like 10,000 scientists uh, involved. So this is clearly potentially an enormous step forward in particle physics, uh, but my job is to convince you that this is also uh, relevant to uh, the universe. So I, I thought I should start off by uh, briefly summarizing uh, the current state of knowledge about particle physics. Uh, which can be summarized in uh, what we call prosaically the standard model. So there's a, a bunch of matter particles, quarks on the left, uh, leptons on the right. Uh, they sort of, they come in three layers or generations. Nobody really knows why. Then of course we have uh, four fundamental forces between these particles. Uh, two of them are very familiar to you. Uh, gravity, of course, uh, electromagnetism, and then there are the strong and weak nuclear forces that act inside the nucleus. Strong ones hold them together, weak ones enable them to decay radioactively. Quite slowly, uh, slowly because of the mass of the W boson, and that is, of course, one of the big puzzles in the standard model. So I, I like to think of what you see on this screen as, uh, in some sense, being cosmic DNA. Uh, these particles, their properties encode all the information needed to make all the visible stuff in the universe. Notice I said visible stuff, and we'll come back to the invisible stuff later on. Okay, so uh, the founding fathers of the standard model include Abdus Salam, whom you see here, uh, Glashow and Weinberg, uh, tested by experiments at CERN. If you go to the uh, CERN uh, theory division, there's a sort of open air museum outside where you can see this piece of apparatus that did a fundamental experiment in 1973. You don't see anybody in white coats anymore. And uh, very detailed experiments have been done verifying the predictions of the standard model at uh, the per mil or, or better level. Okay, so we have the standard model. However, there are open questions. And the first one of these questions, uh, illegible because red on blue doesn't show up very well, uh, why do particles have mass? Uh, is this due to the mythical Higgs boson? Uh, does that mythical Higgs boson get what our American friends would call an assist from supersymmetry? Uh, why are there so many different types of matter particles? I had three layers of matter particles. Why three? Why not five? Why not just one? Uh, can we unify the fundamental forces? Uh, as we'll see, this may also be helped by supersymmetry. Of course, eventually you guys are interested in the quantum theory of gravity. It might be based on string theory, which again would require supersymmetry. So in this talk, when I'm talking about uh, you know, potential discoveries at the LHC, in addition to the Higgs, I also spend a fair amount of time discussing supersymmetry. So I, I would argue that, that all of these have some sort of connection with cosmology, and I'll develop those connections in more detail in the following. Uh, but very certainly, these are, in some sense, the high-level scientific objectives of the LHC. So let's address the first question, namely, uh, why do things weigh? Well, of course, you know, don't have to tell the audience things weigh because they have mass. And also then have to remind this audience that energy is related to mass, E equals mc squared. Unfortunately, these two distinguished gentlemen somehow forgot to explain where the mass comes from in the first place. And that's where this guy comes in. This is Mr. Higgs. And uh, his theory is uh, written illegibly on the blackboard behind him. So I wear a t-shirt which illustrates it for you. 
So the, the top two lines of the T-shirt, okay, fundamental forces, Maxwell's equations, etc. Second line, you know, how those forces act on particles, the electromagnetic current, and so on. And the two bottom lines, that's the theory of, of Higgs et al. The two top lines are confirmed by gazillions of experiments. The two bottom lines, there is no direct experimental evidence, or at least there wasn't until last week. <laughs> so you, you have this field phi sitting on my T-shirt. And of course, that's quantized like any other field phi. And that quantum is the holy grail, the Higgs boson. So th this is an illustration of the, the simplest possible uh, Higgs potential that you might uh, write down, the famous uh, Mexican hat. Uh, one thing that one should not forget is that the scale, the vertical scale of this Mexican hat is something like 60 orders of magnitude larger than your dark energy. So that means at the bottom of this potential, you're going to have to cancel out to zero to 60, one, one part in 10 to the 60 which is already a bit of a puzzle. Uh, for reference, the, the mass of the Higgs boson, the Higgs boson corresponds basically to radial fluctuations uh, in this Mexican hat. Uh, the curvature corresponds to the mass of the Higgs boson. There's nothing uh, in the theory per se to predict what that curvature might be, hence what mass of the Higgs boson should be. OK, so what was the status of the Higgs boson earlier in 2011? So it has not been found in previous experiments at the uh, left accelerator. So they excluded this yellow region over to the left here. There were indications coming from uh, high precision measurements of the electroweak interactions that it probably lay somewhere around 100 GeV with an uncertainty of perhaps 30 GeV. That's given by this blue band here. Put everything together. Probably it was thought the Higgs boson it weighs less than about 150, 180 GeV. Now, what you also see here is the second yellow band. This was uh, the initial exclusion by Fermilab Tevatron experiments, which excluded a fairly narrow range around 160, 170 GeV. Uh, and let me just describe the anatomy of that in a little bit more detail, because we'll be coming back later to similar pictures in the context of the LHC. So, the horizontal axis is the mass of the Higgs boson. The vertical axis is the, uh, the magnitude of a possible Higgs signal. So uh, the, the line here at 1 indicates the standard model prediction. And this jagged black line here is the experimental upper limit. So sometimes the experimental limit is above the prediction. So that's OK. The theory can survive there. Sometimes the experimental upper limit goes below the theoretical prediction. And in that case, you say, well, the Higgs boson is excluded. And so specifically here, you see that actually the Tevatron ex experiments now exclude two regions of mass at low and intermediate masses. Now, if you put together all the information that we had in, uh, say, middle of 2011, you could come up with this global chi-squared function indicating the likelihood of finding the Higgs at a given mass. So the preferred value was around 125 GeV, plus or minus 10. I promise you that this slide was prepared more than two weeks ago. <laughs> OK? And the, the yellow exclusions have now become gray exclusions. And uh, you see that masses above 200 GeV look kind of unlikely. OK, so uh, certainly we particle physicists are very interested in the Higgs boson. But, but, but why should you cosmologists give a damn about the Higgs boson? Well, for one thing, uh, it presumably was connected with a phase transition that likely occurred in the universe when it was about one picosecond old. Uh, it's even possible that if that phase transition was first order, that that might have been the moment when the matter in the universe was generated. Uh, I've already commented on the fact that we need to understand the vacuum energy in the Higgs in order to you know, somehow get rid of 10 to the 60 background to the present observed value of the dark energy. And we've heard a lot in this meeting about inflation cosmology. Most of those inflation models are based on elementary scalar fields in photons. And it would be nice if we had one example of an elementary scalar field. We don't have any yet, at least not until last week. 
Okay. So, uh, to continue with a the cosmological theme, uh, we've heard how there's a few percent of baryons, 25 to 30 percent of cold dark matter. Uh, most of the energy in the universe is made up out the form of dark energy. And so clearly, you know, I discussed earlier on particle physicists, selection of open problems. Uh, you cosmologists have, you know, a few problems too. I already alluded to where does the matter come from? Uh, what is the nature of the dark matter? We know that cannot be explained within the standard model. That is prima facie evidence for some sort of physics beyond the standard model. Uh, the dark energy, well, okay, we don't need to discuss that. We all realize that's a big problem. Uh, and why is the universe so big and old? That's why we postulate inflation. So, you know, we have problems, you have problems. <laughs> Maybe we can help you solve your problems. In fact, I would argue that it's only particle physics that's going to help you cosmologists solve these very fundamental problems. You don't want any help in this? Sure, sure, yeah. We're all in this together, right? <laughs> okay. So, a lot of your problems go back to what happened in the very early universe. Uh, of course, the temperature was very high, particle energy was very large. Uh, you know, mathematically, if you go back to when the universe was less than about a second old, uh, then the typical particle energies would have been above an MeV or so, and it's clear that you need particle physics to discuss what happened in the first second of the universe. <coughs> so, what is the LHC going to do for you? Well, the LHC, typically, it's going to collide constituents of matter with energies of the order of 1 TeV, and that corresponds, according to this formula, to when the universe was about 1 picosecond old. So, you know, you astronomers may think you're, uh, you know, big men on campus, right? You go see this cosmic microwave validation 380,000 years after Big Bang. Oh shit, you get 1 picosecond after Big Bang. <laughs> okay. So, uh, here just to remind you is that uh, before 380,000 years after Big Bang, there were no atoms. Hence, no chemists, <laughs> and no cosmologists. Uh, before three minutes, there were no nuclei. Before one, before one microsecond, we believe there were no protons or neutrons. And before one picosecond, we believe there was no mass. The dark matter, in many theories, would have been produced somewhere between one picosecond and one microsecond. And as I mentioned earlier, the matter-antimatter asymmetry of the universe might have been created when the universe was a picosecond old. So there's certainly plenty of things that the LHC might be able to cast light on. So here is the LHC. Previously I showed you a, a bird's eye view. Now we've got a, a mole's eye view. So here we are, 100 meters underground, 27 kilometer uh, circumference. Uh, we are looking for the origin of mass, the nature of dark matter, properties of primordial plasma, matter-antimatter asymmetry. And to do that, we collide mainly protons, but also sometimes heavy nuclei. Uh, the energies of individual protons are currently 3.5 TV, but we hope to increase that to 7 TV in a couple of years' time. So, around the ring, uh, there are four major experiments. Uh, so, there's two of them, CMS and ATLAS, which have as their primary goal looking for new physics, Higgs, supersymmetry, dark matter particles, and so on. Then, top left, we have the ALICE experiment, which is expressly designed to look for the collisions of heavy nuclei and probe the nature of the primordial plasma. And down the bottom here, we have the LHCb experiment, which is trying to measure matter-antimatter differences may be related to the origin of matter in the universe. So I'd like to remind you that uh, India is uh, heavily involved in the two left-hand experiments, ALICE and CMS. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that uh, the experiments are looking for. This is a computer simulation of a uh, Higgs boson. So in this simulation, protons collided along the diagonal axis produced a bunch of charged particles shown by those tracks, and a Higgs boson. Higgs boson you don't see directly because it is A, neutral, and B, unstable. But what you see is what it decays into, which are specifically these two energetic particles over here and those two energetic particles over there. So, so this is a sort of poster child 
for what we're hoping to see as evidence for the Higgs boson. So what do we actually see? So uh, this is uh, not exactly a poster child, but it, anyway, it's one example of an interesting event that was observed by the Atlas collaboration a few months ago. So here you've got a, a couple of energetic particles, just like in the previous simulation, coming from the decay of a Z boson. And uh, that's accompanied by a large amount of missing energy, such as might be produced by two neutrinos, such as might be produced by the decay of a Z boson, such as might be produced by a Higgs decaying into two Zs, one of the key experimental signatures for the Higgs boson. Okay. Yep. This is, we heard earlier about the dance of the seven veils. This is also a little bit going to be like that. This is not the latest result on the Higgs boson. This is last month's result. Okay. But the last month's result was already very interesting. This is actually a, a compilation of results from uh, Atlas and CMS. Again, predicted line in the standard model one. Uh, the upper limit is shown by this solid line here. It goes below the dotted line in the middle. You could have a standard model Higgs boson up at large masses or potentially at low masses. Now, I would argue that actually that picture already tells us, already assures us that there must be some physics beyond the standard model, beyond the Higgs boson. The fact that we had not discovered the Higgs last month meant that we should expect additional physics beyond the standard model. So why do I say that? Well, you could be over on the right-hand side, right? I said, well, there you could have a standard model Higgs boson. But over on the right-hand side, it would be a very strongly coupled Higgs boson that our present tools don't enable us to control. And moreover, we have to work hard at in additional interactions to explain the precision electroweak data. So over here, I would say there's two reasons why there should be additional physics beyond the Higgs. How about the middle range? Well, the middle range, uh, you can't have something as strongly coupled as a regular Higgs. It has to be suppressed in some way. But if it's not quite a Higgs, then it doesn't quite do the Higgs job, and specifically it doesn't quite give you a calculable theory, in which case it is rubbish, unless you add in some additional physics. Now, the low mass case is interesting. Uh, well, it was interesting already before last week, but it's even more interesting now. So in this region over here, you might say, well, yeah, that's okay. You could have a standard model Higgs boson with you know, conventional couplings. You know, what's, what, what's the problem? The problem is that in that case, uh, there is a quantum instability in the electroweak vacuum. And I would just like to talk about that a little bit. So th these are theoretical constraints on the Higgs mass. So the Higgs mass here is shown on the vertical axis. Now, it's a little bit like the old Greek myth of Scylla and Charybdis. Either you might have a coupling which is too big, in which case the theory blows up when you try to extrapolate to high energies. Or you might have a mass which is too low, in which case renormalization drives the Higgs potential negative. That's the quantum instability that I mentioned a moment ago. So the value of the energy or the value of the scale up to which you could extrapolate the standard model depends on the mass of the Higgs boson. So for example, if it had been 300 GeV, then you'd run out of luck you know, around the TV scale. So what did the previous LHC exclusion plot show us? It told us that this whole high mass region was excluded, including the blow up region, including the region where you could imagine that you could extrapolate the standard model up to the Planck scale. The only region that was left last month was the region where you have this quantum instability. And the only way to cure that quantum instability would be to introduce new physics. And actually, supersymmetry is a wonderful example of the new physics that would do the job. OK, so um, dark matter could be made of supersymmetric particles. So uh, supersymmetry, as you know, theory that relates particles with different spin. I like to uh, think somewhat poetically of particles as being ballet dancers pirouetting around at different rates, some faster than others, 
supersymmetry is the only symmetry that could relate those particles with different spin. In addition, in addition, it would stabilize the electroweak vacuum. It would help fix the overall scale of particle masses. It would help unify the fundamental forces. It actually predicts a relatively light Higgs boson, 125 GeV, just fine. And as I already mentioned, it could provide the dark matter. So this prediction for dark matter comes about because in many supersymmetric models, you have a quantum number, multiplicatively conserved quantum number called R parity, first pointed out by Faye, which is related to baryon number, lepton number, and spin. So regular particles like you and I, we have R parity plus one. Uh, unseen supersymmetric particles would have R parity minus one. Multiplicative conservation, you have to produce them in pairs and they have to decay into lightest particles and the lightest supersymmetric particle uh, has to be stable because it has no legal decay mode. Okay, so what could it be? Well, it presumably doesn't have strong or weak inter or electromagnetic interactions, otherwise it would bind with regular nuclei. So there's a whole list. If you look in your Spartacle data book for the year 2020, you will find various candidates, this neutrino, uh, supersymmetric partner of the photon Z and Higgs that we call the neutralino, or the supersymmetric partner of the graviton. So the first of these has probably already been excluded by experimental searches. Uh, the lightest one would be kind of a nightmare for astrophysical detection because of its very weak interactions, although probably at LHC you could detect it. Most attention actually focuses on this one in the middle, and that's the one I'll be looking at in a moment. So this is an example of what production of a dark matter particle might look like at the LHC. How do you detect dark matter? You can't see it. Right. So what you do is you look for the other stuff in the event, this simulation jets, and you balance out the energy momentum. If there is momentum that's missing, as there is in this simulation, there's momentum missing in this direction over there, you say, well, that momentum must have been carried away by invisible particles, uh, maybe neutrinos, but with a bit of luck, maybe dark matter particles. And uh, this is not a simulation. This is a real event. So here you've got a bunch of stuff coming out in the top part of the detector. It's not balanced by anything visible in the bottom half. So, you know, it could be dark matter event. Probably it isn't, quite frankly. This is probably just emitting boring old neutrinos. But this is an example of the sort of thing that people are looking for. Okay, they're looking, but they haven't found it. So uh, this is a compilation of many, many different constraints on supersymmetry uh, as a function of the masses of unseen supersymmetric scalars and unseen supersymmetric fermions. So I won't go through the details of all these. These are all different ways of looking for supersymmetric particles. Uh, all you need to know is that up to masses of you know, several hundred GeV or one TV, these things have not been seen. And they haven't been seen by the other experiment either. Nor, of course, have dark matter particles seen by direct search experiments. Uh, the most sensitive of those is the Xenon 100 experiment that you see here. And there are various other experiments with less sensitivity to dark matter. Some of them claim a positive signal, uh, but I don't think there's consensus to accept those claims at the present time. And in the following, I will just be assuming this upper limit given by the Xenon 100 experiment. So, uh, for the last few years, I have been engaged in a collaboration roughly speaking, half theorists and half experimentalists, where we try to put together all the constraints coming on supersymmetry, Higgs bosons, dark matter, and so on and so forth. And uh, we put them into a sort of large statistical meat grinder, and uh, out the end, we produce constraints on the supersymmetric parameter space in a couple of simple models. And uh, that's what's shown here. Uh, so again, the supersymmetric scalar mass along the horizontal axis, the supersymmetric fermion mass on the vertical axis, and uh, the red regions are what we would prefer 
at the 68% confidence level, the blue regions at the 95% confidence level, and uh, the solid lines are what we were predicting two months ago, and the dotted lines are what we were predicting the year before. So you can see the impact of the LHC. Not, the lack of supersymmetry of the LHC was not really inconsistent with the previous hints about supersymmetry, but it was certainly pushing out to larger values of the mass. So uh, in that paper that we wrote uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we had a prediction for the mass of the lightest supersymmetric Higgs boson, looking very much like a standard model Higgs boson, and that's shown by this red band. So we were predicting that the mass should be around 120 GeV. So the yellow region is the region excluded by LEP. Uh, theoretically, in the supersymmetric models we studied, you couldn't get a mass above 130 GeV. There was a narrow range in between, and that narrow range just happened to include 125 GeV. Okay, so now the moment you've all been waiting for, uh, what is the current status of the uh, Higgs search uh, as of last week? So uh, those of you who follow the BBC and the blogs will know uh, the LH Higgs boson may have been glimpsed at the LHC. So this concretely is the uh, global results of the two searches on the left by CMS and uh, on the right by ATLAS. So again, we have a, a horizontal line at one, that's the theoretical prediction. Uh, you see that the black solid lines go below one over most of the mass range, so the Higgs boson is excluded, but there's a couple of interesting upward fluctuations around 125 GV, independently in CMS and Atlas experiments. Actually, CMS sees a somewhat broader enhancement. Uh, they put together a bunch of different signals. Uh, Atlas uh, prefers very much a signal around 125 GV in two specific channels, which you'll see in a moment. So, has the Higgs boson been discovered? The answer is a resounding maybe. <laughs> so, as I've told you, there are interesting hints in uh, both experiments around 125 GV. Uh, there's a little bit of activity, particularly in CMS, uh, at lower masses, but no, also Atlas actually has a little fluctuation around 119. So I, I, I showed you my pre-discovery prediction. Actually, our pre-discovery prediction was 119. And uh, we had a sweepstake at King's College London, and I put my money on 119. And I'm not prepared yet to concede defeat. <coughs> Mary, did you vote? Okay, okay fine. <laughs> anyway, right now it looks like 125 is uh, the most likely value. So this is a, a compilation of the uh, signals in the Atlas experiment. So uh, there's a little twitch in photon-photon. There's a little twitch in ZZ. And there's kind of a broader enhancement in WW. Uh, and the overall significance, according to Atlas, uh, in their search is uh, just above three and a half standard deviations. Not enough to claim discovery. Might be enough to write a paper saying possible evidence. CMS presents their results a little bit differently. As I mentioned, they actually look at quite a number of different channels. Uh, and if you focus on 124 GV, it's interesting that all these different channels have a little hint of an enhancement. But those little hints are pretty small, and even when you put them together, whoops, you get something like two and a half sigma. But not even enough to write an evidence paper. So what happens if you combine them? So the LHC experiments have a whole sort of machinery for combining their data. 
That takes months to grind away. Uh, so they have, of course, been scooped by a blogger, Phil Gibbs, who produced his compilation in two hours. So you can't rely on you know, what he's done. On the other hand, he did the same thing back in the summer, and he actually did a pretty good job. So you know, it's not completely stupid. So what you see here is uh, that it looks like you could have a Higgs boson with the standard model strength around 125 GV. Uh, there's a sort of shoulder here at 119 GV. I'm, I'm still watching it just in case. Anyway, I, I should say that this compilation has not been endorsed by the experiments. They will tell you it's complete bullshit. But they said the same thing in the summer, and it turned out that actually he did a pretty good job. So, you know. OK, so what happens if you combine this uh, non-discovery of the Higgs with all the other constraints? So uh, the red preferred regions open up, in particular, to larger masses, open up to larger masses because, quite frankly, 125 is a little bit high from the point of view of supersymmetric models. It's consistent with supersymmetry. But if that were to be confirmed, that would correspond actually to supersymmetric masses you know, in the TV range, a, a couple of TV, maybe even four TV. So if the Higgs boson does turn out to be 125 GV, then it might be quite some while before supersymmetric particles are discovered at the LHC or, or elsewhere. It also might be some while before dark matter is discovered, because uh, if you go to large M Higgs, you go to large particle masses, you go typically to smaller dark matter scattering cross-sections, and that's what you see in this. Uh, I, I should mention, by the way, that uh, this is, these results here are based on a, a paper that we wrote earlier on this week. I haven't been on the beach all the time. <laughs> now, as I said, I haven't completely given up on 119. So uh, if the mass turns out to be 119, then the predictions for the supersymmetric masses would be somewhat smaller, and correspondingly, the prediction for the dark matter cross-section would be somewhat more encouraging for a dark matter search experiments. OK, so in the uh, two minutes remaining, I have two topics. The first of all is uh, the matter-antimatter asymmetry. You all know about the Sakharov mechanism. Here's Sakharov visiting uh, CERN about 20 years ago. Uh, you know that uh, for this to work, you need CP violation, and you need more CP violation than in the standard model. So CP violation, of course, was discovered in 1964. It's been measured in the decays of B particles. What is known so far is described within the standard model, not sufficient to explain the cosmological baryon asymmetry. However, just last month, the... Uh, LHCB experiment at CERN announced evidence for CP violation in the decays of charmed particles. So this came as quite a surprise to theorists. It's not yet known whether this really would be evidence for physics beyond the standard model. The theorists are trying very hard to catch up with the experimentalists. But at least one can say that a new frontier in CP violation studies is being opened up, and this is potentially interesting for the future. Finally, I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, heavy iron collisions, which are a way of creating hot and dense nuclear matter, the sort of thing that might have filled the universe when it was a picosecond old. So, of course, the motivation for that originally was to study the quark-hadron phase transition. It came as a, a mighty shock to many people uh, a few years ago when you know, those ADS-CFT guys came along and said, well, actually, you know, we can calculate some properties of this strongly interacting quark gluon medium, and specifically, we can calculate the viscosity and get a mind-bogglingly low value, as you heard uh, earlier on this week from uh, Shiraz Minwala. So, uh, there have been measurements uh, previously at the Wick Accelerator in the US, now with the Alice and other experiments at CERN, that confirm that this fluid that you produce in these heavy ion collisions indeed has a very low viscosity. 
and there's people now planning to do analyses of the medium which produces fluctuations much like you know, what you guys are studying with the CMB. And uh, this is the experimental value of the viscosity in this medium. It is very close to the minimum predicted by the SCFT. And in fact, the viscosity is way lower than in the superfluid helium, which is used to cool the LHC magnets. So maybe we haven't seen supersymmetry, but at least we've seen superfluidity. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. I hope I've convinced you that there are a lot of connections between the Big Bang and Little Bangs, uh, dark energy, dark matter, <laughs> the origin of matter in the universe, <coughs> Higgs boson, perhaps supersymmetry, matter-antimatter asymmetry. And uh, I hope that you're all convinced that not only can the universe teach us something about particle physics, but maybe particle physics can teach you guys something about the universe. Thank you. So uh, these uh, results were obtained, the preliminary results, with five inverse femtobarns of data. So five. Okay. Now, in fact, uh, not all the data was analyzed fully. So potentially, in two or three months' time, there may be some uh, strengthening of the analysis. Now, uh, in 2012, the plan is to run the accelerator uh, to get something like three times as much data again. So. The total amount of data will be four times as large. Statistical uncertainty is reduced by a factor of two. So given any luck, that should be sufficient to determine whether or not the Higgs boson exists. Uh, so you, you mentioned that the uh, problem is with this vacuum. Even in the 125 GeV, there is, I think, some problem with instability in the vacuum. Because, uh, but the time scale is very, very large, right, for the instability. Yeah, it's not going to happen next week. But so I said, don't worry. This is going to happen in the life, and it's, uh, this is much more unlikely than uh, the history of the universe. Right, right. right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what, what I'm imagining then, I mean, you know, for the example of optimistic point of view, it is 125, and the standard model is understood. And so what is missing is some mechanism for stabilizing this, and not anything more Right. So uh, certainly the time scale is very, very long. I mean, it's not that the theory is wrong because the vacuum should already have decayed. That's not the case. It's, it would be, you know, trillions of trillions of years in, into the future. But nevertheless, you feel a little bit uncomfortable living in an unstable vacuum, I think. Now, if you want to fix it up, uh, there have been a, a couple of papers since the non-discovery of the Higgs that say, well, if it is 125 GeV, then you would need new physics you know, somewhere before 10 to the 11 GeV. Now, what sort of new physics? Well, uh, Actually, in a paper I wrote with Douglas Ross several years ago, we sort of went systematically through how you would get rid of this vacuum instability. And we actually think that it would look a lot like supersymmetry. But that's not necessarily the case. There could be other examples. But, but this argument would you know, be a little bit like you know, St. Augustine and chastity. You know, God may give us supersymmetry, but not quite yet. I'm just the same. I mean, not, not that I don't think it's whatever. Roger Bellows' idea of that, you know, the very distant future, Actually, it would anti support it because what would happen would be you'd, if you think of this Mexican hat that I showed you, it's got a bump in the middle, and then there's the bottom where we sit now, and then it goes up, and then it would go down. Okay, so actually you would make a transition to a very, very large value of the Higgs field. So. 
Eh? I would like uh, uh, you know, to comment about uh, neutrino mass. Because uh, matter neutrino is so, so lower, that much lower than the one of all the electrons and, and quarks, that people think that there is not, it is not the X mechanism giving matter neutrinos, but such an other mechanism, a much higher temperature, which is your comment. Well, it, it, it's certainly true that the uh, mechanism for giving uh, masses to neutrinos must be different. It, it could still actually go through the standard Higgs, at least in part. And, uh, well, if I, if I come to my T-shirt. So, so normally you would write down psi bar psi phi, so it would be linear in the Higgs field. But it could be that actually for neutrinos it's quadratic in the Higgs field. Okay. And then you'd have to have some mass parameter in the denominator, and so that's a big parameter, then you get a small neutrino mass. That's sort of, in essence, the seesaw mechanism. Yeah, if I were a cosmologist, I would have asked what particle physics operates at 10 to the minus 36 seconds, rather than at 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Important things like inflation occurred at that Okay. Well, yeah. Obviously, we would all like to know what happens at 10 to minus 36 seconds, but the uh, the global budget is insufficient to get there just yet. Also, one or two technological limitations to overcome. Uh, so, I think, as I commented earlier on, the existence or otherwise of an elementary scalar field is an important point of principle. Okay, which could cast light on possible mechanisms for, uh, for inflation. Uh, actually, there are even people who claim they can do inflation with the Higgs boson. Now, I don't know whether this is really credible or not, but anyway, there are claims that that might be possible. Uh, but uh, if you would like to denote your personal savings to uh, towards a 10 to the minus 36 second accelerator, uh, I'll match them. John, uh, as far as I can see, your, your T-shirt doesn't have a supersymmetric uh, terms. Uh, uh, is, that, is, that, uh, <laughs> is that related to the so far known, known observation of supersymmetry? I guess the question is that, is that beginning to bother you? Are you really looking more seriously to alternative to supersymmetry? Not yet? Well, I, I must confess, I, I, I did actually have a lapse last month. And with some colleagues, I, I actually joined you know, the other bandwagon, which doesn't have an elementary scalar Higgs, but actually has a composite Higgs boson. Uh, presumably some sort of strong interactions you know, somewhere around the TeV scale. I, I'm still not convinced that any of those scenarios uh, have been worked out in sufficient detail to be sure that they're consistent, for example, with the precision electroweak uh, data. But, 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 but maybe, okay. Uh, so in principle, those models can be uh, distinguished experimentally from a standard model Higgs boson, for example, by the sorts of measurements that the LHC is, is currently making. Okay, uh, but actually has a composite Higgs boson. Uh, presumably some sort of strong interactions you know, somewhere around the TeV scale. I, I'm still not convinced that any of those scenarios uh, have been worked out in sufficient detail to be sure that they're consistent, for example, with the precision electroweak uh, data, but, 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 but maybe, okay. Uh, so in principle, those models can be uh, distinguished experimentally from a standard model Higgs boson, for example, by the sorts of measurements that the LHC is, is currently making. Uh, and in fact, several of those models are severely constrained or ruled out by what I showed you earlier on, if you take it seriously. But anyway, that's going to be the big you know, battleground in the coming year uh, to see whether those theories can survive. So, we have to stop. So, thank John for the work you talk.
Starbucks. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's a complete secret. I don't know who's won it. And father is supposed to make it dramatic by putting this the name as well as the citation. Present duty to honor one of our young colleagues, so let me find who it is. So, not the name, first I'll read the citation. The judges of the session W1 on classical general relativity and gravitational waves were Sukanta Bose and Sanjay Jingan. They have appreciated the excellent quality of posters submitted to the session and found it a challenging task to select the best poster. In the end, they have decided to award two posters. One half of the post, uh, prize goes to the poster, depletion of energy from naked singular regions during gravitational collapse. The author is Sukartu Barwe of Pune University. <laughs> the suspense is for the next author. So, hold your breath. The other half of the poster, uh, prize goes to the poster, a new window into the stochastic gravitational wave background. The author is Aditya Roti of Ayuka Pune. Thank you. We move on to the next session and before I do so I can let out a little secret the award is a cash prize of 10,000 and a certificate from ICGC signed by the, the person presenting it okay so now let me move on to W2 which is the uh, session on cosmology and I would like to call upon James Preebles to come and do the honors <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I have the prize. I open the envelope. They have given the award to the poster characterizing the diffuse backgrounds for redshifted 21 centimeter single signal, GMRT 150 megahertz observation. The author, the author is Abhik Ghosh of ITT, IIT Kragapur. Perhaps my pronunciation is inadequate, but the poster certainly is. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I wanted to add that the jury for this uh, were the workshop chairs. Uh, Shriram, Lakshmanan Shriram Kumar, I think he's just left or he's still around, and Ekiro Komatsu. Okay, and now finally we get to the third session on quantum gravity and early universe, and uh, let me call upon uh, Abhay Ashtekar. Well, since we are just concluding, and I think I happen to be the person who did the last honors, uh, so I should also take this opportunity to express our gratitude to the organizing committee, I mean, particularly T.P. Singh, for organizing this wonderful, wonderful scientific meeting. It was, at least I found it extremely stimulating, and also organizing it in this beautiful place up here. So let us give a big hand to T.P. and all the members of the organ local organizing committee. Thank you, Bala, Jim, and Navay. So, before we conclude, I mean, I get off the stage, let me thank you all again for making this meeting a big success. I think a part of the success, just to point to IAGRG's role in it, was their uh, you know, early planning. We started, uh, TP and I were given charge about two and a half years back, 
and uh, it's been a great experience and working with the SOC which was extremely distinguished and extremely friendly towards someone who's young and trying to coordinate this and I would really want to thank all the plenary speakers who made it here this is probably my first experience where we had just one dropout in the and that was also two months back so I'm glad that people could come and I was always worried that there would be people who would have last minute you know collaboration meetings or you know visits to Stockholm or something like that with will keep them from coming but I'm really glad everyone came and I really thank you for uh, coming I should also mention besides the SOC uh, there was also the workshop chairs who made life very easy I mean, once we had selected the workshop chairs, I mean, there was no reason for anyone to at, at all look at what abstracts came in, and you know, they were dealt with very well. So let me, um, since they're all here, so let me thank them very warmly. That is uh, Shinji Mukhonomia and uh, Justin David for the W3, then Sriram Kumar and Akiro Komatsu for the cosmology and um, Sukant Bose and Sanjay Jhingan for the classical gravity and gravity waves. Okay, um, I won't take any more time and let me call upon TP to say the final words. So, I won't take too much of your time. Everybody has a flight or a train to catch. So as ICDC 2011 comes to a close, it is my pleasant duty to thank all the organizations and individuals who made this conference possible. We thank the IAGRG for inviting the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research to hold the 7th ICGC, the seventh ICGC. We thank the ICTS of TIFR for making this ICGC a part of an extended program, Frontiers of Cosmology and Gravitation. Without the generous assistance provided to this program by the ICTS, it would not have been possible to do an ICGC in Goa. The organizers are also grateful to Ayuka Pune for accepting to be a part of the Frontiers program and for providing moral support and encouragement to the ICGC conference series over the last two decades. <coughs> This ICGC also received unprecedented sponsorship support, and we hope this trend will continue for the ICGCs to come. The conference has greatly benefited from the support given by the following organizations. Department of Science and Technology of the Government of Goa, Association of Friends of Astronomy Goa, the Infosys Science Foundation Bangalore, the Foundational Questions Institute USA, Harish Chandra Research Institute, Allahabad, Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, Center for Astroparticle Physics of SINP, Kolkata, and Ayuka Pune. The organizers thank them all for their vital assistance. I wish to express my gratitude to some key individuals who played an important role for this conference. My thanks go to Sanjeev Dhurandar and Shyam Date, the then president and secretary of the IAGRG, for inviting me to chair the local organizing committee. My thanks and admiration go to the chairman of the scientific organizing committee, Tarun Sarudeep, for putting together an academic program of the highest quality. Thanks, Tarun. We owe greatly to Tarun and to the entire SOC for making this ICGC an exciting event. <laughs> Thanks are due to session chairs T. Padmanabhan, Varun Sani, B.S. Satyaprakash, Sanjay Jhingan, Sukha. <laughs> These guys are really passionate about what they do, and without them, this won't be possible. Thank you. We received valuable assistance from our student volunteers, Swastik Bhattacharya, Manunita Chakraborty, Suratna Das, Anuradha Gupta, Kinjal Klochan, Mandar Patil, 
Preeti Mishra, Aruna Mukherjee, Asim Paranjpe, Seema Satin, and Satyabrata Sahu. I hope I did not leave out anyone. If I did, my apologies. <laughs> the conference has not been without glitches, and there were indeed some goof-ups on our part on the accommodation front and with the transport. The considerable distance to the conference hotels, a go and feature, was also somewhat of an issue. We regret the inconvenience caused to the participants on this account. Looking ahead, we recall that the conference proceedings will be published online by the Journal of Physics conference series. We, rec we, re we request all contributors to submit their write-ups and help us make this recording of this Silver Jubilee event a successful venture. Let us hope this ICGC will also be remembered for having played a significant role in the birth of LIGO India, a birth which many of us are looking forward to eagerly. <laughs> Lastly, I wish to call upon the stage my team of buddies who have worked tirelessly to make this ICGC happen. They are organizing committee members, Shyam Date, Please. A. Gopa Kumar. Shubhabrata Majumdar. D. Narsema. and our very valuable support staff, V. Chalathurai, please come. <laughs> Margaret D'Souza, Ashok Deshpande, Nishikant Kadam, Vijay Kadam, Shobha Jagtap, and S.H. Gadiali. Thank you. All of us take this opportunity to thank you very warmly for coming to this conference and look forward to meeting you at the next ICGC. Fir milenge. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs>